You're listening to Give God 90, where we're not afraid of the tough biblical questions, because we will dig through the language, the culture, and the history to find the truth revealed in the words of our Creator. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Give God 90, Radio On Demand. My name is Jerry Mitchell, your host for Give God 90. Thank you for allowing me the honor and privilege of uh, spending some time with you for just a little while, whenever you're listening to this. Radio On Demand means that you get to listen to it whenever it's convenient for you. Uh, That way, you get the most benefit. And if you have downloaded the Give God 90 app, you have even more freedom to do that. Okay, because when you download the app, uh, you get uh, to take it with you. You're not stuck to a computer. You can, you know, whatever mobile device you have, whether it's Apple or Android, Android, it is a free uh, download. You can get it absolutely free because somebody else has paid for it. If you choose, now this is your choice, you can help support Give God 90. You go to the uh, givegod90.com, uh, locate, I think it's on the I believe it's on the contact page is where it's at. It's kind of hard to find because I don't put it out there for a big thing, right? But I have had people say, you know, where do I help support you? Uh, And it's it's on the website. You can click the, there's a donate button. I need to change the the name of that, but that's the choice I had at the time. Uh, Just click that and, and you can support us any way you want to do that through PayPal or however you want to choose. Uh, you can mail us a check if you want to. I don't care. Now, it is not tax deductible for a lot of reasons. For a lot of reasons. Mainly because I don't like tax deductions. Uh, I, I don't like uh, somebody else telling me what I can say to you. Okay? And that's, that comes with that if it was tax deductible. Uh, the other thing, a better way for you to support us go ahead and purchase one of the books, either Tradition to Truth or God's Universe, God's Rules, available wherever fine books are sold. And you can uh, locate those. It's, you know, wherever you buy books. Okay, that's the best way to do it. That way you get something, I get something, and everybody's happy. Uh, There's also a place on there where you can order some of the pictures that I've taken. I've got to get some more on there. Just haven't had a whole lot of time, excuse me, a whole lot of time to do that yet. But they're there. Uh, Something else you can do, we are an affiliate with Zero Shoes. You can absolutely go on there and, and order something if you like. If you don't like them, don't think they're for you, hey, you've checked them out. And we get credit for even, we even get credit when you simply check them out. Okay, it's that simple. Uh, so, you know, make use of the, of the things that we offer you, uh, which reminds me, uh, probably beginning next week, not this coming week, but the following week. Uh, on Thursdays when I do our live at 730 Eastern time, uh, I will probably be extending that to about an hour. And if you would like to sponsor all of it or part of it, uh, let me know. You can send me an email or a private message through Facebook. You can contact me any way you want to contact me. uh, And just let me know you want to sponsor some of that. If you have a store, we will mention the store. If you simply want to sponsor it with a favorite uh, Bible passage, that is absolutely acceptable as well. However you want to do that, we, we can make that happen. And uh, we will we will certainly make sure that uh, you have the opportunity because what I want to do is, you know, for some strange reason there has been a worship community come together around us and it's it's worldwide it reaches from the Philippines to Italy to Uganda Ukraine Australia Hawaii we're all over the place. And I want to give each and every one of you the opportunities to support each other as well. And I think that's a good way to do that. Because if if somebody maybe in, I don't know, Australia hears that you have something available, maybe, maybe it's something that they think they can use. And 
you know, it, it's it's a possibility that you know. I know uh, a couple of people here do uh, uh, very very nice cards. Uh, some of them are cut out cards, and then another one is a painted type of card. And you have your little Etsy shops or whatever it is. You can uh, then kind of, if you sponsor it, they know about you. You can get together and you know send them some, and they can enjoy what you have. So it's just a way of attempting to bring uh, all of you a little closer together. <clears throat> now, let's get into what I want to talk about today because I want to go into a little more depth and a little more detail and a little more uh, <laughs> study, I guess is a good way to say it, than what I was doing on uh, Thursday night when I began introducing Christians to the Fall Feast. And if you listen to that, uh, I'm going to just reread something I had Meyer read, and this is my translation, okay? And it comes from Hebrews 10, 1 through 5. For my Jewish listeners, don't worry, uh, you're going to see where this goes. It says, or, or I should say, it reads, I say, because this is my translation, all right? The Creator's instructions contain shadow pictures of good things that will happen. Not a clear picture of what will happen, but instead images of what will happen. The sacrifices offered year after year could never make man perfect, because if they did, one sacrifice would have been sufficient. The sacrifices were constant reminders added after the covenant was given and then broken that we sinned and deserved the death penalty. The blood of bulls and goats is not capable of removing sin. Only, only God can remove sin. He is the only one who is cap perfectly capable of saying we'll never speak of those things again. And we began talking about the first day of the seventh month, seventh biblical month. Uh, modern uh, Judaism considers this Rosh Hashanah. And I didn't go into the Rosh Hashanah controversy on Thursday because it was just going to take way too much time. And, and I didn't want to spend a whole lot of time explaining something um, as simply complex as this is. And, and if that s sounds contradictory, it kind of is. Rosh Hashanah came about after the Babylonian exile when the uh, Israelites came back from Babylon. That's when we see uh, the months being named instead of counted. And we see Rosh Hashanah taking place instead of Yom Teruah, which was given in Leviticus 23. Now, here's, here's why it is sort of controversial, but they almost, almost have a leg to stand on. Rosh Hashanah uh, is typically translated as head of the year, but it could also be translated as source of the year. Now, we know that in Exodus chapter 12, uh, Moses was given the instructions that in the uh, spring of the year, in the month that the barley was of Eve, this would be the beginning of months for you, Right? If you go back and you read that, that's what you're going to see. When the, when the barley was at a certain stage of ripeness, that's when the, the first part of the year would begin. Now, what's this deal with the source of the year? Every, uh, well, I should be careful how I say this, practically every Middle Eastern uh, culture understands that creation happened in the fall of the year. Now, if that, that sounds a little odd to you, remember that uh, Usher, when he wrote his Annals of the World, calculated backwards from his point in time in about the 16th century, and he calculated backwards to the beginning of creation. And he said that the beginning of creation took place, and he very specifically says, if the sun, the moon, and the stars had been there at the time, day one would have been uh, just a, a few days after the autumnal equinox. Okay? It would have been the first Sunday after the autumnal equinox, I believe is, is how he phrased it. 
let's think about that for a minute. If all of a sudden we have reached back into history and we can understand that God spoke creation into existence or our our universe of creation into existence in the fall of the year why uh, uh, just a couple of thousand years later did he say well it's going to you know spring when the barley is at this stage of ripeness this will be the beginning of months for you well it's it's pretty easy to see it's pretty simple to understand creation happens approximately six months prior to when we're told to begin counting months in Exodus chapter 12. Um, I said that, and that, don't be confused, okay? Creation happened a couple of thousand years before the Exodus event, right? But let's, let's think of it this way. If it was in the fall, now we have... Uh, Passover in the spring, it's going to take about that much cycle for the mature barley to to produce seed and come back. So now, what's happened was God created in the fall of the year in preparation for a spring event. I hope that makes sense to you. When we when we think about the beginning of creation in the fall of the year. We've got to think about a certain life cycle time to get back into a, or or to begin a, a fulfillment of agricultural cycles that take about six months to happen. So as all of this comes in, don't forget the flood. We've got to include the flood in this explanation. Noah gets off the, the boat He's certainly looking for the signs and the seasons when he should be planting. So he goes ahead and begins to reseed. Now the earth is coming back to life, right? Everything's coming back to normal. So is it, it, it's not, it, it shouldn't be that much to comprehend that the beginning of when uh, Moses was told to count the months would be in the spring because he had a certain observable, uh, repeatable, uh, <laughs> what's the word? What's the, empirical. Okay, there's another good word. It's something that happens time after time after time after time that he could touch, feel, see. He understood and knew. Okay? He knew when the barley was going to be ripe. He knew when this was going to happen. And it was dependable. Because, and it was dependable because that's the way that the Almighty designed it to be dependable. So now we come to the spring of the year. We have the first of the months. Okay, now I think we are ready to count seven. And we come up to what for a long time was Yom Teruah. It was celebrated as a day of shouting. Uh, a day of, uh, oh, look at what we have accomplished. We've gotten this far. And then, as, as a, and something we're going to discuss this week is going to be the 10 days of awe and uh, Yom Kippur, day of covering. Let's now, let's not, let me not get ahead of myself. I'm going to try not to get ahead of myself as much as I want to get to the 10 days of awe and Yom Kippur. I want to stick really with Yom Teruah. Why is this such an important date? And I I discussed a lot of it on Thursday uh, very quickly, very, very quickly. Uh, What I went over was there is a huge uh, number of people who really uh, believe that when the, the Messiah comes to collect those who belong to him, okay, It will be on the first day of the seventh month. It just makes sense. When the seventh trumpet sounded, think about that statement. When the seventh trumpet sounds, the first of the month, back when the barley is of Eve in the spring of the year, the new moon is sighted, 
the new month begins, the new year begins, and you begin to count one, two, three, four through the through the months. They weren't named. As we see this, on the first month, the shofar is sounded. The first trumpet for the first month is sounded. Okay? That all goes out. The signal fires are lit just like every other first of the month, and it lights the darkness across Israel. Uh, Yeshua said in Matthew 24, I believe it was 24... um, when he said that the, uh, yes, it was twenty four twenty seven. When you know, the Son of Man comes to collect his own, he, he he's going to be seen by everyone. It will be just like lightning flashing across the sky, just like those signal fires light the sky. Later in Revelation, we learn it's a seventh trumpet. When the seventh trumpet sounds, seventh month. Seventh trumpet. You see how all of these pieces begin to to fit together when we look at this forensically instead of trying to interpret what did he mean by that? Could he have meant this? Could he have meant that? Could he have meant something else? When When we start guessing, even though it may be our best guess, we're still guessing. But when you look at all of the other evidence, and I'm not talking about two or three pieces here, I'm talking about all of the other evidence. These shadow pictures point to events. The Almighty said, I am going to put my calendar in the sky for you. You don't have to go to whatever store you go to to buy a calendar today and get it. It's already there. It's free of charge. You simply have to learn how to read it. Okay? The other thing he does is he says, I'm going to give my prophets... All of the information that they need to disperse to the people so that the people who actually know what I mean are going to understand what I mean. They're going to hear my voice. They're going to read what I've given. And they're going to be able not to interpret and and really not to decipher, but they're going to be able to put together the pieces that I have given to Daniel the pieces that I have given to Isaiah, the pieces I've given to Jeremiah, the pieces that I've even given to Paul, the pieces I've... You see how that all fits together. I hope that makes sense. It it makes sense in my mind. It doesn't always make sense in other people's minds, okay? (laughs) And and really, I'm I'm being a little funny there, but I'm not really being a lot funny there. Uh, I want you to understand this from an aspect of we've got to stop thinking uh, as 21st century Americans and we've got to start thinking as people who are going to inherit the kingdom of heaven whenever that happens. Now, I don't know what year this is going to happen, but I do know that chances are great it's not going to be this year. Okay? Okay. We don't have all of the pieces of prophecy fulfilled yet that Yeshua told us needed to be fulfilled before that happens. We have things in Malachi that are said. We have things all throughout all of what Moses wrote, what prophets wrote. Uh, It's all here. We just have to be able to put the pieces in the proper places. And I I think... And, and if somebody out there can can say, no, I, th- I think you're wrong uh, because it says this here or this here or this here. Please use Scripture if you're going to try and, and convince me that something's wrong. But I believe with the information I have right now that I can safely say there is an excellent, excellent, excellent chance that God designed this blueprint and that when when He sends out and that seventh trumpet sounds, to gather the ones who belong to him, that sky will split open, and it will be on the first day of some seventh month, biblical month. Don't know what year yet, but I do know we're getting closer. I do know we're getting closer. Why is that important? That is is important. (laughs) Oh, my heavens, that's so important. (sighs) Because as we count down to the coming of the new age. 
and the ushering in of the millennial reign. Look at what has to happen. There has to be several years of peace in the Middle East. We haven't had that yet. But we're working on it. The, the, um, the, the and I, I got to be careful how I say this too. <laughs> the, the, the peace that's beginning to occur between certain Arab states, certain Muslim states, and Israel. Now, why did I make a distinction between the Arab states and the Muslim states? This is important to know. Arab states still hold fast to the basic foundational concepts of Abraham. They recognize Abrahamic law. They understand that Ishmael was Abraham's son and that everything that Ishmael gave in the Quran comes from his understanding of Abraham. Okay? That's the Arab state as as good as I can uh, briefly explain it. Okay? There's a lot more that goes to it than that. Now, the the current Muslim states that we see that are making peace, they are a little more aggressive. They take not just the purest form of the Quran, not just that Abrahamic law, but they want to incorporate some of their cultural things as well. Uh, You can can call that Sharia if you want, uh, but even that, it goes a little further than that sometimes. Why why are these people needing to make peace? Well, they don't. They don't they don't have a desire to uh and I need to be careful how I say this too. There's no burning desire among the nations to make peace. But they understand from a deeper meaning. And and what I mean by that is even the people who think they reject the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, must, must conform to His will. And He will work it so that they will. And and think about it this way, okay? And, And I've, I've been trying to figure out a good way to explain this. Does someone who rejects God, and I'm not talking about someone who doesn't know and they're searching. I'm talking about for someone who says, don't bother me with the facts. My mind's made up. There is no God. It doesn't matter whose God it is. There is no God. I'm the only God. I pray to myself. That person is who I'm talking about right now. Does God's covenant apply to that person? Well, no, because covenant is participatory. You have to have a desire to be part of it. If you want to live outside of it, you can, but that does not mean that you are outside of the Creator's desires and what is go- what He will do to glorify Himself to reach the end results that he desires. I hope I just made sense of that. For the person who rejects the Almighty and says, nope, I'm my only God. There is no other God but me. Okay? For that person, the covenantal law that was given at Mount Sinai does not pertain to that person. But that does not mean that person is outside of of what God will do. Okay? It doesn't mean that he won't be influenced by God. It doesn't mean that God won't use him to influence other people. And it doesn't, certainly doesn't mean that he's not going to be judged according to the way the Creator decides to judge. All right? It simply means that he's not, he's choosing not to participate in something that 
the people who are typically going to be listening to this are going to say, oh, that's exactly what I need. That's exactly what we've got to do. Why can't everybody see this, right? Which is the whole purpose behind Give God 90 anyway. If you choose to, to try to live as close to the Creator's instructions as you can for 90 days, your life will improve. It has no choice. It must improve because that's the promise. So let's think about this for a second. The nations that are currently making peace with Israel, some of them recognize Abraham. Some of them do not. But all of them are going to be used and influenced by the Almighty to accomplish the things the Almighty chooses to accomplish. Now, hopefully, Israel will be wise enough to look around and see what's going on and go, oh, here we can check this off as prophecy, we can check this off as prophecy, oh, things are not going to bode well for us if we do the next thing, right? I don't think they're that wise. Sorry, Israel. But I really think that there's still some blindness in part going on where the and Rosh Hashanah is a good example of this. Remember in Isaiah chapter 1, the Almighty says, I don't like, or I, he actually says, I hate your new moons. He still enjoys his the way he designed it. He still wants you to celebrate that the way he designed it, but he hated the way it was becoming now. He didn't like the names of the new months. He doesn't like the names he's been given that that were given to, to replace what he had given. Instead, he says, what I did was what I wanted. I created it. I made it. It's how I wanted it. You changed it. I don't like it. That's what he's saying. So as Israel now, as a nation deals with the surrounding nations, everyone is under the influence of our Creator. Everyone's under the influence of of the Almighty who has an end plan, who has an end game, and who has a desire that not necessarily nations will come to Him, but people come to Him. People return. People grab hold of that little piece of pure Israel. Not not the country, the people. Not the country, the people. The the, the nation, the political party Israel, is different than the people party Israel. Just like any other nation in the world. I, I know people from all over the world who are wonderful people. Some of them are very proud of of where they come from. Some of them aren't. What we need to be uh, is making sure that we as believers are grabbing hold of the pure Israel, being grafted into the, the, the descendants of Abraham that the Almighty chooses. Not the ones who are, well, you know, I can claim I'm Jewish, Right? So I'm good to go. That's not necessarily going to get them where they want to go because even Ezekiel says, "Uh, uh, uh, don't be so quick to think that, right? When we think about these fall feasts and how all of this comes together and how all of this fits together, it's it's affecting more. It's affecting more than just the people who are celebrating it. They're available to everyone. Yom Teruah is available to every person. Every person. Christians, I suggest very strongly that you study this, that you look through the evidence. There's more than I've had time to present. For my Jewish listeners, I really hope you choose 
to look through the evidence and you choose to celebrate Yom Teruah instead of Rosh Hashanah. Until next week. And, and like I said, I can go for a long time talking about this. Till next week, have a blessed, blessed week. Thank you.